tonight. We're going to continue tonight, obviously, what we started uh, this morning as we are looking through what will be our, <clears throat> our theme and our focus throughout this year. Uh, here I am to worship, of course, from the song we just sang, and then the submission of all of our nature uh, to God. It's the, as William Temple said, it's the greatest expression of which human beings are capable, uh, the completeness of our being, being invested in God. And so uh, as we progress forward, let's just review kind of uh, where we've been. Well, those are the lyrics of the song, so we've already been there. And uh, <clears throat> this statement by Temple, very good. You can Google it and look it up again. It's very good. Okay. So we talked about this morning to begin the meaning of worship, uh, the idea of the inferior approaching the superior, understanding who we are and who God is, and um, <clears throat> that... We are unworthy to be in his presence on our own account, uh, but Jesus qualifies us and, able, uh, and, and enables us to be able to do that. Then we talked about the being of worship, the one who sits on the throne, that <clears throat> worship must be centrally focused on Jesus. Okay? It can't be one of these things where uh, a lot of times people turn worship into even, and I'm not necessarily talking about changing what God has designed for worship, but even those who would worship in a way that, that uh, would be consistent with Scripture, uh, sometimes they turn worship into a personal thing for them. It's about me. It's I, what am I getting? What am I drawing? What am I? I? And I is the only consistent theme uh, throughout their discussion and their understanding of worship instead of it being in the third person, which is he. It's about God. It's not first person I, it's third person he that it's God is the one who is the object of our worship <clears throat> and he is certainly deserving based upon first of all just who he is and second of all especially in relationship to us what he has done for us uh, and so keeping that focus and realizing that we're connecting with a being and not just uh, some kind of an abstract idea uh, is very very important then uh, we spent some time talking briefly <clears throat> about the motive of worship, and that is to the glory of God. Our lives are to be lived to the glory of God, obviously, Matthew 5, 16, 1 Corinthians 10, and verse 31, and worship is no less than that. It is a time when his children come together and spend time glorifying him, shining the light upon his greatness and proclaiming it uh, to themselves, but more importantly, proclaiming it to him. All right. Then we <clears throat> talked about the worshipers, the idea of the priesthood of believers, that you and I, uh, can bring our worship to God and God would accept us and you know for us that's become so common but in other religious groups uh, that's not a common thing they have to go through a clergy system and especially in ages past when you study church history there was a long period of time where a certain religious belief suppressed individuals and um, really took advantage of them and did not allow them to do things that um, a Christian should be able to do. And so <clears throat> we have to keep that in mind. We are a priesthood of believers worshiping uh, together. Then we spent some time talking about the worship leaders, the one who, uh, sorry, I have something in my eye. I'm not sure what's going on. Um, <clears throat> the worship leaders, the ones who lead. And so we get the, the premise, while we don't have a clergy system on one side, there are men that have to be qualified in order to lead. And the basic qualification is <clears throat> that they have to be Christians in faithful standing with God. Okay? And uh, because they're leading other people in their worship to God. And so <clears throat> there has to be consistency in their life, 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 8. And then this morning where we left off, we started introducing what many people call the five acts of worship, actions of worship, avenues of worship. There are a number of different terms that that people use to describe them. What, however you describe them, uh, they're all very important. And we spent some time talking about uh, worshiping <clears throat> in prayer. That in prayer, as we offer our prayers to God, we're showing our dependence upon God in the process and shining a light upon His greatness and our insufficiency to answer the problems, basically, of this world. Um, there are so many different things that go on in this world we wish we had the answer to that we wish we could solve, but they're beyond us. Um, and it's not just a lack of invention. They're always going to be beyond us, and only God himself can fix them and reverse them uh, at the time of his choosing. 
So when we pray, we're doing that. We're thanking him for who he is and what he's done, a number of different elements. So let's pick up tonight here looking at number, I think, would be seven, and that is worship and song, the fruit of the lips. In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 15, the Bible says, Through him, that is through Jesus, then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of the lips that acknowledge his name. And so the fruit is a, is a product. So that which comes off the lips that acknowledge the name of God. And one of the ways that is done is through singing. Okay, We're acknowledging him. Now singing certainly has <clears throat> an element to it that is horizontal. And we'll see that when we look at these acts of worship. That it has a vertical element. Obviously it's primarily directed toward God. He's the one that's receiving the worship. But it also has a horizontal element, a benefit that, that um, is felt by all those who worship. Okay? And so <clears throat> worship, first of all, is praising God, the fruit of our lips, singing praise to him, and magnifying his name is one vertical element. And there are certain songs, even in our songbooks, that are geared that way. <clears throat> their, fo their, their sole emphasis is upon God himself. Now... As we sing, there are also, as we said, that horizontal element. You think about Ephesians 5 and Colossians 3, which are very similar texts about teaching and admonishing one another, or speaking to one another in psalms and in hymns and in spiritual songs. And spiritual songs being those songs that have spiritual overtones to them. They may not necessarily be only directed at God. <clears throat> it may be a way of encouraging, uh, of encouraging one another. For an example... Uh, uh, a song we sang this morning, Farther Along. What is that doing? It's encouraging us to remember that even though we may not understand everything that's going on right now, farther along, one day we will. Okay? And so there's a, a spiritual message to it that's encouraging us and moving us forward. And obviously, uh, God is the focus of that because he's the one who will help us in that process. Now, we will also spend some time, there will be a couple of, of sermons on, there will be one sermon just simply discussing music and the fruit of the lips and things along that line. But I also want us to give some attention to, in uh, a study, I'm not exactly sure, we'll figure it out when we get there, but um, I want to give attention to the use of or lack thereof use of instruments in our worship to God. It's a controversial issue. Um, <clears throat> The churches of Christ have often been pigeonholed in that controversy, um, saying, you know, that, that you, know, you hear a number of different things. You don't believe in music, um, which is kind of strange to me because you sing, that's music. But um, <clears throat> this is what I want to say just in precursor to all that, and we'll get into it more. Biblically speaking, there are a lot of things to say, but what a lot of people don't realize when they say, well, that's just a Church of Christ issue. That's the way they try and frame it. Well, if you will open your church history book, you will find that it's not just, quote, a Church of Christ issue. It is an issue that has caused great controversy amongst millions of people throughout the ages who have claimed to follow Christ. There's a lot of debate. As a matter of fact, the majority of history has stood against the use of instruments in worship to God. The majority of church history has stood against it. Okay? But a lot of times we simply assume because we, we live in a society where it has become so common and accepted, we assume that's the way it's always been, but that's not the way it's always been. And we have to look into history. Obviously, biblically is the foundation for it all, but when we look into history we learn that maybe things now aren't the way that they've always been. And we need to pay attention and ask ourselves some of those important questions. All right? <clears throat> Number eight. We look at worship at the table or the Lord's Supper when we meet in sweet communion. Of course, taken from the words of one of our songs that we sing. <clears throat> but you remember, Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper as a reminder of what it is that he had done for us on the cross for us to remember on a regular basis and a weekly basis. <clears throat> that uh, the bread representing his body, the cup representing his blood, and his blood bringing with it multiple elements. 
that it reminds us, he says that this is the blood of the covenant, right? So this is the new exodus. This is the new Passover meal, except it's not an annual meal, it's a weekly meal. And it's one where we consider and we contemplate what Jesus has done and that his blood that was shed for many for the remission of sins. It's a reminder of <clears throat> our forgiveness that we have in Christ. We need that reminder constantly in the forefront of our minds. Otherwise, we can, <clears throat> we can forget what it is that Jesus has done for us. But it's even more than that. It's even more than a reminder. It's actually a time to commune with Jesus in the supper itself. In Matthew 26, when he's instituting it in verse number 29, he says, I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Now, there are two different schools of thought about what he means there. Some people believe he means that that's something that would transpire in heaven. It's certainly plausible. It's just not the one that I subscribe to. I think he meant literally, he would, <clears throat> that he partakes with us in my Father's kingdom in the church. As we partake in the Lord's Supper, we commune with him uh, in that sense. And so it's a time to connect to Jesus and to be reminded of his love for us and <clears throat> what he has done for us. And so paying attention to that is always going to be important. The early church found it to be extremely important, obviously, as Jesus instituted it. Acts 2.42, the breaking of bread in that context is the Lord's Supper. A little bit later, a similar phrase is used, and it's more of a context of a common meal. Uh, Acts 20 and verse 7, they're coming together. They're eating the Lord's Supper together. Um, one of the things to remember is that the Lord's Supper, as we partake of it, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with this, but the Lord's Supper, as we partake it, is, is small emblems, okay? We're not intending to make a meal off of this, or at least I'm not. Um, <clears throat> I mean, here lately I can't get enough food, so um, this is not intended. But originally, when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, what was it? It was a meal. Okay? It was a full-fledged meal. It was the Passover supper. And so <clears throat> we simply have chosen to adopt a smaller version of that um, in order to remind us of certain things, and we'll get into some of those types of issues as we progress further. But communing with Jesus in the Lord's Supper is of vital importance, and we want to pay attention to that uh, as we walk through this together. Then number nine, worship in our, whoop, there we go, <clears throat> worship in our giving. Knowing the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ is what we're calling it. Uh, that comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 8, when the Apostle Paul is talking about, in the context, a collection for the poor saints in Jerusalem, and he talks about how churches have, even in the midst of their poverty, really shown up and started giving to the to the saints that are in need and he says this in verse 9 for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich talking about in heaven okay every, though he was rich yet for your sakes he became poor and the word for poor here is a word that means a beggar it's the same word translated in Luke chapter 16 that describes Lazarus a beggar it's not just being poor in the sense that, you know, I don't have as much as other people do. It's the sense of being wholly dependent upon somebody else for your very existence, okay? And so Jesus became poor so that we, through his poverty, being impoverished, his incarnation, his suffering, we might become rich. We might inherit heaven, okay? So giving is very important. We seek to help other people, not just, we seek to help people period, because it's what Jesus has called us to do, but we help them physically and we help them spiritually, okay? We try to help people connect to Jesus, we try to help people physically, and every time we help someone, uh, whoever that may be, it's supposed to serve, as, as you think about this, let's say you help someone in a physical need, that should be a physical reminder of a spiritual reality that you and I have experienced in Christ. When we help someone who is in need, we're doing to them, we're practicing the gospel, aren't we? We're helping someone the way that Jesus has helped us. 
spiritually speaking. And so when we give, <clears throat> when we make sacrificial giving, okay, that is planned sacrificial giving, what we're saying is, is that God is important. God, as we give to him, is not an afterthought. The work of the church and the giving to the church is a budget item, right? It actually has a place in, in our existence and uh, in all that we are because we want to take care of the work of God and we're also acknowledging our dependence upon God, okay? <clears throat> as you think about Old Testament giving, how much sense did it make to give away your first fruits? from a human standpoint. It doesn't make any sense. Because you would think what? I take care of myself first and then I give. But God required the giving of the first fruits. That was an act of trust that said I trust you to give more. And so <clears throat> in our giving we're showing that we recognize that what we have is not actually ours. That what we have is actually given to us by God. And even though we may go to work and earn it in that sense, and the Bible is certainly behind that premise, ultimately it's God who gives it to us because everything belongs to him. All right? <clears throat> so we're also acknowledging the importance of the work of God uh, as we support, and so we're <clears throat> showing the same sacrifice um, of Jesus and connecting with him in that way. All right, number 10. Talk about worship and preaching. <clears throat> Hearing, seeing, and savoring God. So preaching has always been a, as it, with these other acts of worship, has always been a staple in the acts of worship, or in the early church from the very beginning. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Okay? Now the apostles is not the doctrine they were making up, it's the doctrine they were given through inspiration of the Spirit. And so the proclamation of the gospel and the things of God is something that is a staple in the worship service. It's a time to hear from God, okay? It's a time to hear what God has said, to see who he is, and to enjoy and glory in that, okay? So preaching then has to become focused on God. Preaching has to be God-centered. So we have to be cautious that we don't end up turning the Bible into Aesop's fables, right? Fables, you got, you got nice little stories and they have a moral to them. And sometimes we can do that to the Bible if we're not, if we're not careful. I, I remember, I've had many conversations through the years about this with people, and one person says, you know, I, just give me something to take home with me. I said, okay. I'll give you something to take home with you. Now, what he meant by that was, <clears throat> give me some practical tips of things I can do. Here's the thing. Sometimes what we take home with us is look at God. It's not a nice little moral story that says, do this, and now your life will be complete. It's look at who God is. That's worship. It's God-centered. It's not you-centered. It's God-centered. Now, as we look at, at God, for an example, I think about <clears throat> a text in Mark chapter 5 that I've heard used, and in, in, I'm concerned about the exegesis of it. Uh, when Jesus casts out the demon-possessed man, the legion. And a number of people will look at that text, and I've heard people try, <clears throat> heard preachers try and justify it, and they basically preach it this way. They'll look at the story and kind of explain what's going on, and then they'll make the application and say, Jesus can cast out your demons too. And what they mean by demons is your problems. The only problem is that's not what that's talking about. Okay? So I want you to see if you I want you to see if you can see a difference in these two approaches. Jesus can take away some of your problems. Your demons that that plague you. Whatever those demons may be and we'll list them off. 
Now, <clears throat> that's certainly a true biblical statement, right? Jesus can take away and handle our problems. That's not, I'm not denying that. What I'm denying is I don't think Mark put that statement there. I don't think Mark put that story there so that you and I could look at it and go, Jesus can heal our metaphorical demons. He put that story there to say, look at Christ. No power of hell and no scheme of man can ever stand against him. Now, I don't know about you, but I find a lot more comfort in looking at a, at a being who controls the very forces of hell at the word of his mouth. And that when they see him coming, they come and fall in front of him and beg him for mercy. As opposed to saying, you got a few difficulties, Jesus can cast out your demons. There's a difference there. One, <clears throat> we need to pay attention and stay God-centered. And as we do that, we will be challenged. We will be challenged to change in, in other places. As we see God, inevitably, it will challenge us to conform ourselves to that image. And so, <clears throat> preaching that is done biblically is one that exalts the text. Okay? And shows God through the text. And so, <clears throat> some people... There are a couple of different ideas and ways that people have illustrated it through the years, but one that I like is, is basically this. <clears throat> that is, in preaching, it's like looking through a window. So what you're doing in preaching is basically raising a shade and letting people look through the window at who God is. Okay? And so they can see God, and they can enjoy who God is, and they can savor that once they see who God is. That's what preaching is about, helping people to see God. You see, I think w many times we're well-intentioned. We want to help people, and so we focus on people and their needs. But what we have to understand is that if you will simply focus on God, everything else will fall in line. He will be the answer to those things, okay? So <clears throat> worship in preaching, and that's how in preaching it is considered worship because we're looking at who God is. And we're looking at him saying, look at his beauty. Look at his heart. Look at his justice. Look at his mercy. And so, <clears throat> it allows us to see him. Number 11. There is a, a reorientation. There's a perspective of worship. And that is we begin, we're reoriented with reality. Okay? Uh, psalm 73. In Psalm 73, which is a psalm we studied, I think, at the early, early part of this year. Or this last year, sorry. Still in that old mode. Um, <clears throat> where Asaph is writing, <clears throat> and he's looking back on uh, some struggles that he had. And he said that I was envious of the wicked. He said, look at the wicked. They have no health problems until they die, and even then they die comfortably. Nobody ever challenges them. Life seems to go easy for them. And here I am, and I serve God, and I've washed my hands in innocence. Life is not easy for me. If we're honest, I think a lot of us have probably been down that road before. But then he says this. He said, when I thought how to understand this, it was painful for me. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I discerned their end. He went to worship and his perspective changed and he talks about the change in that perspective throughout the rest of the psalm saying, surely you set them in slippery places. Just because things are good for them now doesn't mean that they're always going to be good for them, especially in eternity. That there is more to life than what I can see right now. That just because you have delayed punishment of their sin doesn't mean that you've denied it. But when I went to worship, I was reminded that the world was more than what I can see with my eyes. I was reminded that right and wrong will be punished and rewarded. Worship has that sense of reorienting us to the realities of the world that sometimes we can lose as we walk in the world. 
and Jesus and God allows us <clears throat> and changes our perspective. Then finally, talk about the danger of worship, and that is of offering unacceptable worship. There is, <clears throat> all throughout Scripture, there are warnings concerning this. Old and New Testaments everywhere, every dispensation, where God will punish someone for worship that is inappropriate or unacceptable. Excuse me. But in John 4 and verse 24, <clears throat> when we worship God, it's a must, it's an imperative that we do so in spirit and truth. Hebrews 12, 28, we're to offer acceptable worship to God. Okay? So, <clears throat> then we can go through and we can look at tons of, of examples where worship was done in a way that was not the way God prescribed it to be done. In Leviticus chapter 10, Nadab and Abihu, they got their fire from the wrong place. God had a pretty strong statement about that, a pretty strong response to that. Um, <clears throat> and so we have to be cautious. In Deuteronomy 12, before they went into the land, he cautioned the people not to worship him just anywhere, but in the place that he had chosen to put his name. He's very serious about how he's approached, because we are sinful people approaching a holy God. And it doesn't matter if I see anything wrong with it or if I think it's appropriate or not. What matters is how God views it because he's the recipient of it. And so we have to be cautious there. And it's more than just even the actions that we might do, add, or subtract in worship. It's also our attitudes and our lifestyles. You can look at Isaiah 1. You can look at Malachi 1. You can look at Jeremiah 7. You can look at Amos 5. All these texts where God calls the people on the carpet basically and says... You live how you want to live, and then you walk in here and expect me to accept you. You lie, steal, kill, commit adultery, worship other gods, and then come in my house, which is called by my name, and say we're delivered to do all these abominations. It's okay because I went to church. No. As a matter of fact, God tells them in Isaiah, I hate your worship. In Malachi, he says, I wish somebody would just close the door because at this point, it's ridiculous. There's danger to it. We have to keep that in mind. <clears throat> so hopefully, as we go through this, we can drive ourselves more deeply into the heart of God that we worship and understand how these things that he has left for us, uh, actions or avenues that he has left for us, help us... Um, not just in our worship, but help us to connect ourselves to his heart. And when we come together, we can echo the words of the song that we sang a moment ago. That we can come to God and say, here I am to worship. That's why I'm here today. I'm here to bow down. I'm here to affirm what I've affirmed for a long time, that you're my God. And that you're altogether uh, worthy and wonderful and lovely and beautiful to me. You're all that I want. And when, I in, when we invest, when I invest, when you invest all of ourselves in worship, it's the greatest expression of which a human being is capable. As a matter of fact, it's the end to which we were created. To glorify God. And to enjoy his presence and to worship him and that's our end so tonight we ask the question if we are willing to come and to worship to make the declaration that God is our God to be a penitent believer in Jesus to confess our sins and to be immersed in water for the forgiveness of our sins that we might be accepted before God and forgiven welcomed into his family or maybe as a New Testament Christian, <clears throat> we have gone after other gods, which are no gods, and we need to be restored back to him. Or maybe we're struggling or something else. We're here to worship. We're here to give ourselves to God. And if that hasn't been the case, it's a wonderful opportunity for us to recommit to that. If we can help you tonight, let us know as we stand and sing this song. <clears throat>